Molt bé, doncs gràcies als que us heu quedat fins tan tard. Ara passaríem a fer aquesta mica de debat, una mica breu. Hi ha algunes persones que us he volgut convidar? Sí, i menys, i menys. Ara us citaré, però abans no em volia oblidar de donar les gràcies amb el Col·legi d'Arquitectes, per mi és un honor estar aquí presentant això a casa i haig de dir també que la Maria Elisa, que acaba de veure en realitat no soc jo el cap de l'oficina Copenhagen Ice a Barcelona o no soc només jo la cara visible d'aquesta oficina ella també és arquitecta i amb ella els dos fem l'equip d'aquí de Barcelona llavors amb aquesta fila zero sí que hem intentat tenir una mica de paritat però ens ha sigut molt difícil, no ho heu aconseguit. Ara, si de cas, mentre aneu pujant, simplement ara us diré una pregunta, un comentari que podeu fer i després fem, si algú més del públic té alguna pregunta, doncs també podem fer aquesta mica de debat, que no podíem estalviar-nos de fer-ho, tenint en Michael aquí. Llavors, la regidora Mercedes Vidal està aquí, sí? Si pots pujar, sisplau, Mercedes. En Pau Noi, Pau Noi ha marxat? Sí. Vale, perfecte. Pots escollir. La Sílvia, també, sisplau, Sílvia Casorran, si pots pujar. Àlex Fernández, l'Alejandra Llevana, també, si pots pujar. Francesc Magrinyà, sí, gràcies per quedar-te fins tard. En Bruno Remue, Javier Ortigosa, on la tenia aquí, gràcies per pujar. I crec que, Alfonso, si t'animes a pujar... Hi ha molta gent. Bé, després és obligat que hagis algun comentari, si no te preguntaré jo. I en Rocco, Rocco, si vols pujar... Sí, sisplau. O Rocco o Núria, com vulgueu. Acabes d'arribar? Llavors no val. Michael, si vols estar aquí. Jo sí que vull fer un comentari abans que feu els vostres respectius, i és que quan vaig veure aquesta sèrie, jo soc bastant fanàtic, no només de les bicis, sinó també dels animals, i he normalment he tingut gos jo a casa meva i vaig veure durant molt de temps molts capítols del César Millán que és el susurrador de perros de Doc Whisperer i quan vaig veure la sèrie vaig pensar ell és el City Whisperer perquè és bastant aquest estil que es podria parlar llavors la qüestió seria que vosaltres féssiu simplement una és una mica una pregunta doble trampa seria una pregunta en el sentit de del que heu vist en aquests dos episodis, què penseu que... què us ha inspirat per portar aquí a Barcelona, que és allò que penseu que persona encara no està fent, que està fent moltes coses, que els catalans fem moltes coses. Què heu vist d'aquestes dues ciutats que podríeu o que us agradaria que es fes aquí a Barcelona? I després al revés, perquè sé el Michael no m'ha volgut dir quan però Barcelona està a la llista per ser una de les properes dels propers episodis i què és el que vosaltres penseu que de Barcelona voldríeu que quan vingui ell, que vindrà a fer el capítol, que sortís de Barcelona per inspirar a les altres ciutats del món llavors començo per allà si de cas, Rocco bé, no us he presentat però Faig breument una presentació. En Rocco Naia és arquitecte de l'Ajuntament de Barcelona, Javier Ortigosa de l'Àrea Metropolitana de Barcelona, Departament d'Urbanisme, l'Alejandra Llevana també és arquitecte del despatx de l'Enric Miralles, Valle Roig, sí, no, Valle Roig, perdó, perdó, Francesc Magrinyà, enginyer, que, bueno, amb mil coses, ja molts el coneixeu, la Sílvia Casorran de l'Àrea Metropolitana, apartament de mobilitat, especialitat en tema bicicleta, perdoneu, la veu, l'Àlex Fernández, ell és dissenyador industrial, té un laboratori que es diu The Bicycle Laboratory, en el que ha guanyat 
premis per dissenys de bicicletes i d'aparcaments, premis internacionals. Mercedes Vidal, regidora d'urbanisme, de mobilitat, estic massa nerviosa. I en Bruno Remue, que és arquitecte, fa molts anys que té un despatx aquí a Barcelona i jo he tingut l'honor de treballar amb ell durant alguns anys també. I en Michael, que ja el coneixeu. Rocco. Well, first of all, thank you for everything, for the films and the ideas. Um, if you mind me a minute, I, I, I work now for the City Hall of Barcelona, but in fact I belong to a different city uh, as, a, as a public servant belong to Villanova y la Geltrú, which is uh, 65,000 cities. Of course, they don't last the same, last, they're not everlasting, but maybe the changes are more profound somehow. That's my point, or that's my question at the same time. What do you think about that? I think we've all been students and we all had to make food every day with very little money <laughs> and we can still be creative with very little money but yeah when you have a I mean I come from Copenhagen and there's a lot of money and then there was no financial crisis there so we are building a brand new metro ring and we're, we're building a lot of things because we can and I would prefer in Copenhagen to have tramways like we used to have for 100 years uh, which would be so much cheaper and we could spend money, you know, the extra money on other things. So I think sometimes if you have a large budget, you, you know, you, you, you shop in, in different stores uh, than, than you need to. So I think, yeah, large budgets uh, can be seductive in, in the wrong way. But I think luckily, globally, there's not a lot of cities that have this problem, you know, uh, especially big cities, you know, it is uh, still a lot of mathematics, you know, and lots of budgets. And um, so I, I, you know, if I, a medium sized budget makes people be really creative, you know, the city administration and the citizens. And I think that's where you find more uh, creativity than, you know, having, you know, all the money in the world to build everything you want to build. And Copenhagen, I think, is an example. Uh, there's many great things about Copenhagen, but there's just too much money. Oh, we're going to build a new harbor tunnel for, you know, billions of euros. And, you know, we have calculated our company what we could buy for that money, you know, and it is just amazing the thing, the transformation that you could have for the money for 10 kilometers of tunnel, you know. So big budgets, uh, no, medium budgets, more creativity. Smaller budgets, I think, even more creativity. So I would prefer something lower, yeah. Hello. Um, I do not have really a question. I just wanted to congratulate you because I think that you put the focus on the spots that are really important about uh, public space recovery, especially safety. In my experience working in Colombia, uh, we had that issue. And uh, I remember in Bogota, there was this case of a girl that was brutally raped and murdered. And then uh, nobody wanted to walk at night. But then if you think about it, uh, many more people get killed because they are drunk and driving. So I think that things like that are very important. I think many is, is uh, due to social inequality. I think social inequality is very important and that makes a system that is completely unequal and that creates a lot of um, lack of understanding between social classes, especially in Colombia where you have uh, a system that actually classifies the use of the land in six social strata. So that makes that nobody from social strata six would mix with social strata one because it doesn't, doesn't make any sense right, for them. So I, I think that this is really important and I just have a little suggestion that is, I think it would be great if you could put data on that, uh, saying that just facts about how, I don't know, having a city with uh, more cars and more, uh, more cars and less bicycles is, uh, is not that healthy as one with, uh, with the opposite case or the violence and, or the car uh, casualties, etc. So that's me, my only suggestion.
Hello. Um, as an architect, uh, we work here in Barcelona with uh, some projects, urban projects, uh, also bike lanes, which is very difficult to find um, in the border of the city. And I was wondering when I was uh, looking at the, um, at the stories that always in the, the citizens go further than the governments and realizing that we need to connect by bike easily, cheaper, and healthy way. So why is it so difficult to get the politicians involved in doing this so small and so cheap um, interventions in the city that we, all of us, understand that are so necessary? You vote for your politicians, not me. <laughs> so, I mean, but we see, like, you know, in, in other examples around the world, like in, in Guadalajara, you know, there's people going out and painting their own, like the guy with the bus lane in Tel Aviv. There's people painting bike lanes all over the world, like temporary ones. And in Toronto, in Guadalajara, I mean, it's, it's, so they, there are examples of, you know, putting pressure on, on uh, politicians in, in other cities. Um, and just generally the whole urban activism is really what we try to, to focus on, that people are, are just doing it. Um, if you remember in the, in the short trailer, in the beginning, there's a lady in, that we talked to in the Bangkok episode, and uh, she said, yeah, we've gotten to the point where we cannot trust the city administration to take care of the city anymore, so we have to do it ourselves. She just says, like, boom. And this is Bangkok, so this is very different than Barcelona and, and Copenhagen and maybe European cities, but it, it is kind of true everywhere. You know, the citizens, um, and I really hope this series comes to, to Catalonian and Spanish television, because it, it's some of the other episodes in Toronto, it's the whole episode, we don't even talk to any public officials. It's only citizens, and in that city, the urban activism, the community engagement is m better than anywhere else in the world. You know, here you see these people and that's amazing, but, you know, so it, 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 it's a question of uh, organizing, a question of, of, of approaching it correctly. You know, you don't want to piss anybody off. You know, you cannot do activism like in the 1970s anymore, right? This, nobody wants this anymore. So you have to be tactical. Uh, you have to be, you know, f social media friendly. There's a lot of ways of doing it, but, you know... Um, it, it is, there is momentum. It's happening. You can see, I mean, all over the world, people are waking up and saying, you know what? My street sucks <laughs> and I'm, I can't wait anymore. So let's go out and put some benches and show, you know, and then often cities say, okay, that's actually a pretty cool idea. So, and they will make it permanent. This is another, you know, the trend is creating a trend in municipalities to, to actually, you know, follow the, the citizens instead of, uh, the citizens waiting for, for, for politicians. So, you know, this is your city. You guys, you figure it out. <laughs> uh, thanks for, for these films because uh, I think your approach is uh, really interesting. It's not a touristic approach uh, for me. Barcelona, <laughs> we don't like this, this, this approach, uh, more touristic, more what the, the buildings are now. And for me, uh, it would be interesting also to to go to the periphery because th th this relation between center and periphery for me it's it's very very interesting, and and also you can consider also the metropolitan area because we talk about Barcelona, Barcelona, but there are a lot of people who talk about Barcelona, but they don't live in the municipality of Barcelona. I think it's a very interesting approach. I, I would like. To, to approach to the to the districts that are more peripheric, for example, no barriers that I don't know, or for example, uh, I, I think uh, near La Mina or other, but you can find the same uh, the same kind of approach that you have made in in this film. I think it will be for me very very interesting. But thanks for this approach because is more. Uh, I I think there is not very a lot of examples of. Uh, an approach as this, uh, for me, it's very, very interesting. I think, I hope the, the, the example of Barcelona. <laughs> I don't have to say something every time, but that was a good point, because in other episodes in Tokyo, if anybody's been to Tokyo, 
or you have images. You all have images in your head of Tokyo, and these are fabricated images of like uh, of the downtown, of the neon, of the karaoke, and everything. But when we filmed in Tokyo, we completely ignored this. We didn't. We didn't give a shit. We uh, we went to the neighborhoods where eighty percent, ninety percent of Tokyoites live, and then you know. I had been to Tokyo many times, but like this was the real Tokyo. And of course, Barcelona is not just the, the Rambla and the tourist shops. I mean, of course, where do people live here? You know, that is, it's, it's really, I have discovered in making the series that, you know, the cities are not just the cities that are on the billboards, you know, it is where the people live in the neighborhoods, you know, and now I'm spending a lot of time in Pueblo now and, you know, it's just super lo more local, gentrified a little bit now, but it's still, you know, and, and ex exploring other parts of Barcelona every time that I'm here, it's really, I've just, good question, cause, or good point, it's because it's really the, the case. And in Paris, you know, in the episode in Paris, they talk about the peripherique. Paris is just the middle, the middle, and that's been like that since they built the walls a thousand years ago. And going just five kilometers outside, and the people there are saying, no, we're not Parisian. They do not think we are Parisian, but it's the same city, right? So it's very important to remember the big picture. Yeah, good point. Um, I just watched the Medellin film because I was late coming from metropolitan area. So, but from Medellin, what I really liked is that the, the tramway it looks like it's connecting something. Not like <laughs> so maybe we can learn something from that. And then I've got a question. Uh, do you think um, public space empowerment empowerment is related to social status? I mean, from your experience in these episodes? Yeah, I mean, the ladies, oh, you didn't see the Tel Aviv episode, but the Arab ladies are sitting out on the chairs like this, you know, and uh, things. Um, and they're being kicked out because of the big buildings. The rich people are moving in. Um, and yeah, who, you, who uses the streets? Uh, you know, in, in many European cities, we are good at using the streets. Generally, we ha always have. Um, yeah, but there is a, a divide. You know, we can see in American cities, the streets were pff, taken away by automobiles. And nobody, you know, the kid learns to ride his bike in the driveway. And, but we'll never ride again because the streets are too busy with cars and no bicycle infrastructure. So, you know, the public... I had a, a discussion on Twitter about public... Sp and the, 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 the new bikes, the dockless bike share that you have here and, and they're coming from China all over the world. Um, and I'm saying this is an invasion of public space. I'm critical of this. And all the Americans on Twitter were like going, dude, it's more bikes, it's okay. But the Europeans were saying, yes. I think we have much more of a, a tradition of, of valuing public space. And I think in Barcelona, you have way more than we even have in, in, in Copenhagen. You know, I think the farther south, <laughs> where the weather's better, <laughs> you're outdoors more often, so maybe there's a, a history. But I think um, social status, yeah, you know, walls put around your big fancy house to protect your, your, your valuables, and everybody else is going, oh, I'm just going to walk to the shop or whatever and talk to my neighbors. So I think there is, um, I think it's a problem in, in a, maybe more in, in other parts of the world than Europe. I think in Europe we're still very inclusive on our streets. I would like to think so. I hope. I would hope so. Um, and certainly in, in, in around the Mediterranean, yeah. But there is a, there is a problem. You know, walls are still going up, you know, um, in, 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 in many, many cultures. So we have to remember that the streets are the most democratic space that we have ever had in 7,000 years of cities. The streets were always ours. We did everything there. And that should, that should still be the case. You know, if somebody wants to live behind a wall, who cares? But the space in front should be public, yeah. Thank you. Um, first of all, see that uh, the stigmatic way of urbanism that we have seen, uh, I think it's very interesting. But one of the way of reading this is the lack of centralizing the desires and uh, needs of, uh, of a collectivity, right? So uh, I just would like to know how do you think is, uh, what's your experience on centralizing these desires in uh, different places and to, to, to arrive to a very good balance in between the l good local solutions uh, with the, mm, other sizes like biggers, uh, so one neighborhood, uh, inside a city and inside a uh, country and inside, you know, how, how do you think it's the best way of centralizing these desires and needs? I don't know if, I mean, it's a, it's a scale, right? Um, I mentioned the Toronto episode. Uh, Toronto is four million people 
around 4 million people. And in 1999, they, they decided to take all of these cities, seven cities, and make one city. Crazy idea, because now there is one city hall, and it's you know a two-hour drive from the people at the far end, and they have no local representation. They don't even have a local borough or, or like neighborhood. Uh, so they're, they are disconnected, which also is the reason that this city is the, the, the most amazing community engagement, because there's nobody here, so let's just do the back alley or do the street. Um, so I think... And I asked the lady from the city, I said, you know, is your job uh, planning Toronto or is it fixing <laughs> Toronto and, you know, listening to the citizens who are doing all your ideas? And she said, yeah, it's basically fixing, you know, oh, this neighborhood has an idea. Okay, we will help, you know, so they just wait for the, the <laughs> it has become an imbalance for them, but in a good way. The citizens are saying, yes, hello, this sucks, fix this. Okay, and the city is chasing the citizens, which is very unusual in the world, I think, but very inspiring as well. So centralized is, is, is tricky. If there is a central organization, like a, a administration, I think that's fine. You know, uh, Barcelona has about the same amount of people. Well, you know, uh, it's a big city. And, um, but there still has to be the local representation. You have to have a, a, a very short distance to democracy to your elected representatives. You don't have to, you know, go to the other end of the city and wait in line. You should be able to, uh, to, to know who the representative is and they are visible in the neighborhood and active. Um, I can't decide that politicians will do that, but I mean, that, that short, short step to your local de democratic representative is, and then they can feed into the, the centralized machine. That's fine, if it's effective, of course. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, there has to be, you have to, know, you have, to have democracy in, your, in every neighborhood. Uh, and your elected officials have to be somebody you can have a coffee with, right? Or wine. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I, if I take many wines or coffees with, with neighbors, but in fact, we do so many meetings. Uh, and, and of course, it's, uh, it's a part of our job, and, and it, it's a great part, because interacting with the neighbors gives the the, the balance uh, sometimes with the with the planifying operations so uh, this uh, constant uh, contact with with neighbors it's uh, absolutely necessary to 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 build the city according their needs but well thank you anyway for for the um, for the films i only uh, was in time to see the the medellin one waiting for the barcelona episode and uh, well i i think you could find here many examples of uh, community engagement especially if uh, you go to uh, to the neighborhoods out of the of the of the city center and something i i would like uh, that when when you make this episode I think it would, it would be mm, more difficult to find uh, people um, happy with interventions like uh, those uh, cheap urban tactical interventions, which is something that sadly in Barcelona uh, we're not still able. <coughs> We're not still able to, um, to I don't know, uh, to make them to make people attractive because there's a strong culture of um, that the, the administrations uh, have to build streets uh, with a large uh, budget, otherwise they're not treating the neighbors like they deserve. And I would really like to change this because otherwise, well, we have. Uh, 100 uh, square kilometers of, of city, and if we do it, if we do everything on uh, <coughs> on super top uh, arrangements, we won't be able to transform the city as we as we want. So we need this cultural change. Many uh, many cities re uh, cities far richer than us are are doing it. So I hope we can change uh, step by step. Uh, to appreciate uh, interventions like the one uh, we saw in, in Medellin near the tramway with some pallets uh, and, and plants. And the neighbors were uh, so proud of uh, that urban intervention. I hope uh, that we can do something similar in Barcelona someday. It's, I'm not, it's not a debate, so I'm just saying um, uh, we see many cities, unusual cities. This is what makes me an optimist, is that we see so many unusual cities. And in North America, that's a lot of unusual cities because they have a totally different tradition for public space as, as in Europe. But 
you have, like last year in Montreal, big North American city, but they had 2,000 parklets where they just took away a car parking spot and had local people build benches. Um, and it was their birthday, 375 years, so they're young. Um, but uh, but they you know the, the, I, two thousand of them that yeah, that was really amazing and and the, my friends in the in politics were saying yeah it was really hard and some neighborhoods hated them but other neighborhoods said can we have four so uh, that's also reacting to the local needs and the, you know as soon as you, you put something on the ground it's harder to hate it if you ask the, you know, hey should we have a, a bike lane on this street the la the neighbors in most cities will say no that's stupid but then if if you put it in um, then it then yeah, they, but then they kind of like, uh, yeah, sometimes. But I mean, generally, once something is there, it's like, oh, okay, that's what you're talking about. Um, and and there, there, yeah, you missed the Tel Aviv, but uh, the girl with the parking lot, you know, she said to me uh, that the visualization of what it's going to look like, this really helps change public opinion. Oh, you want to park? But I need to park my car there. But look, it's going to be a beautiful green park with trees where you can play with your children. Oh, okay. So yeah, just a, a really bad Photoshop, preferably good, but, but you know, we'll change, change, uh, change opinions. But I mean, it is really a question of just getting stuff onto the ground. If there's a total political nightmare, then you can take it out, right? But, but generally, it has to be there first, and then the debate starts. I think that's, really, that's what I see as, as a pattern in a lot of cities, and even cities that have a much more difficult job of, of making stuff like this happen. So it's, it's kind of a trend, you know, just put it out there in the middle of the night and then see what happens, you know. Yeah. That's maybe not I'm for laughing the only at the thought of it. Yeah. <laughs> and the consequences. <laughs> it would rot. Um, I don't know if it's a question of, uh, of um, some kind of comment, but it would be about, <coughs> sorry, about pride. Because uh, I've seen that in, in, in the both cities, people become very proud of their city, of their, uh, the way they can... Uh, have a relationship with public space, with whatever, and many times we we see in cities, even though in in Barcelona at the moment people are losing pride of the city because of uh, of the 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 kind of uh, um, evolution of the the city is uh, is getting at the moment. So, what are the best? Uh, what would be the best imp uh, ingredients for the people to uh, to get back the the the, the proud of the of the city? I think democracy, urban democracy, so democratic, you know, government, of course, is important, is normal for us, but, but having that, feeling that democracy on my street, you know, feeling that I can, you know, my kids want to play there and they cannot because there's car parking and those cars never move. I've watched those cars. Whoever parks there just never, you know, um, and, and, and doing things, act, urban, urban activism or, you know, proposing, making, if I feel like I changed my street, then I am the most powerful man in the history of democracy. That's how I will feel as a citizen, right? And I think that every, every citizen, you know, for many years just sat there going, oh, the city sucks. They don't do anything, fine, they, you know, bitching about it. But I mean, the people who go out and just families who are, you know, in some of the people we've met, it's like the first time they ever did anything, you know, painted a street, you know, with their children to make some nice murals on the street. And, and that, you can just talk to these people and see how it, they transformed. You know, it's like, I did that. Me and my kids painted that and on the street there. And that just gives them the pride, maybe not in all of Barcelona, but on their street, you know, and they are, maybe they will still feel like Barcelonans, but, you know, I did that. That, that urban democracy and the urban activism uh, and tactical urbanism, you know, having a framework where that is allowed, that gives you the pride in, in your neighborhood. And uh, whether, whether it's, you know, not a bike lane or, you know, a, a park, or it could be anything in your neighborhood. If you had an influence on that, then you know you feel empowered and in Copenhagen we have an app and if I see like a pothole or I see a garbage can that is never emptied they have forgotten about this garbage can in their system I can take a photo and pin it on a map and uh, and I get an email saying thank you and we're looking at it and I get an answer within one week and it says yeah we looked at that and we deterred that's not a we, we can't do anything about it or that is going to be fixed and then I have done this myself, and I'm, I am Michael, Copenhagen, I is Michael, but there's this one stretch with really bad asphalt on my way to work on this street. And it's like, it's kind of in between private land, public land, and nobody has taken care of it. And so I was the active urban citizen, taking a photo, getting the email, and then I get the email saying, yeah, we're going to fix it. It'll be, they will start work next week. I felt empowered, you know, I'm curating all of these people, but I'm going, damn, I made that. 
right? And you know, I wanted to stop there in the morning, and everybody who was going past going, "I made this, <laughs> I made this," you know, but I didn't. But I wanted to. I felt I felt powerful. I felt like a powerful citizen because somebody listened to me and somebody changed it, or I was given the opportunity myself to change. That is pride in your street, and that is pride in your city. Sí, no sé si alguna pregunta més. Uh, es curioso que la palabra superille no surtit, eh? I, implícitament sí, pero eh, si tenía alguna pregunta en el público, yo me acosto, Alfonso, no sé si tú quieres hacer algún comentario o en catalán, si os plau. <laughs> no, uh, si no, pasaríamos a demanarle a Michael Castro y la samarreta, ¿no? <laughs> la, la camisa. Todo buen intenso, ¿eh? No. Eso, <laughs> eso. Doncs, uh, bueno, no sé si teniu algun altre comentari o, o pregunta, si no, pues ho deixaríem aquí i esperem que la propera doncs, que, que pugui tornar a ser aquí i que sigui el capítol, no? la premier del capítol de Barcelona. No? Gràcies a tots i a totes per venir. Bona nit.